I'd like to introduce uh, Rod Floro. He's the AIG or Mahi AI teacher at KSKL campus. And I would also like to introduce DJ Hai. He is the, the uh, applied science kitchen culinary arts teacher at KSKL as well. And I'd also like to introduce uh, Hamana Hayden Konanui Tucker, who is an 11th grader on KSKL campus. Um, they have some exciting things to share about how they are using Aina, how they're using science, and how they are transitioning into this new environment of learning and teaching. So I'm super excited to introduce our presenters today, and please enjoy uh, Poi to the World. Hello, um, my name is Rod Floro. Um, I'm the Kumo Mahiai over here, as, um, as Eden has shared. But... Um, yeah, in the next couple of minutes, or next, not next, like 50 minutes or so, um, between DJ and Hayden and I, we'll try to share some Manao on refining some some learning experiences for your Hamana, no matter like what grade you're at, at or like whatever um, comfort comfort level you're at. Okay, so um, as we uh, kind of talk about these learning experiences, go. Cool. Okay. Point to the world. That's us. And um, first things first, like we're, we just kind of want to see uh, where you folks are at. Uh, how are you? How are your students learning? So what you can do right now is this: you can grab your smartphone and you open up the camera. And if you actually you hover over this QR code, it should get you to the Menti website. And just to jump in, in case if that QR code doesn't work, um, you can just go to www.menti.com, uh, and there's a six-digit code at the bottom there. And it's just a quick check-in for for you folks, for us to kind of guide our presentation a little bit more um, to know how are your students learning right now? Is it a full distance? Are you in a hybrid? Are you fully on campus? Um, and that can kind of help tailor our our discussion a little bit more for you guys. And our code for that one is 914819. So for instance, over here at the middle school, we have, um, well, students are back face to face. We're not at full capacity. So we have students, half the students come on one day, other half come on another day. Cool. And very much like our, yeah, very much like our, our what's happening here. We do have a hybrid model. There's still some students that have requested the distance learning option. Oh, awesome. And then I'm a student here at Kamehameha Schools, Hawaii, and um, we're actually doing a hybrid model. Um, and this, just to, to guys to let you guys know that this is a um, live um, tally. So as you guys are filling out this Google form, this is what people are doing as of right now. So this particular app called menti.com, this is one thing that you folks can use in your classroom or your learning environment. Um, and we'll show you another. We'll show you another feature. Unfortunately, there's only two slides for the free version, but oh, you just roll with it. It's all good. Awesome. I just want to share this slide um, because you know some of these, some of the, some of the greatest teachers, right, we're all virtual. Okay. Um, if you kind of think about your experiences with any one of these folks, right, they had. Oh, well, if you watch, if you were part of that generation to experience any one of these. Okay. You can think about some of the things that I don't know. I, I personally remember quite a bit of things, quite a bit of um, experiences. It wasn't ideal, of course. Like you weren't actually like really painting, or you weren't like you know wrestling gators or anything. But you know, there was a lot of really cool things that came up, came up, um, came of these, uh, came of these programs. And then, let's see here. Next slide, please. So before you start um, your learning experience, if you can kind of think about uh, what is you know, what is this learning experience that you're kind of planning? It could be something like pretty short and sweet. It could be something like kind of long term. But bottom line, I think it's always good to have a have a mo'olelo, have a log of how you're documenting all of this. Uh, so I'm gonna be honest, like I'm not really good at that. I, I'm a like doc, getting all my like lessons down and you know, writing all the all the standards and all the assessments, it's not my forte. 
But in the past couple of years, I've learned to just take some pictures, take a couple of pictures. And that's part of my mo'olelo. That's my documentation because there's a lot to be said of that. So about two years ago, I started this uh, Instagram handle for uh, just what's happening in the garden, what's happening in the kitchen. And that's our, that's our handle, KS underscore Anato Opu. And so the reason, uh, and I got to give a shout out to Kalana Veres. I don't know if he's here or if you, any of you know him. But give him a pat on the back or a show, throw him a shaka. I, I don't, we're not shaking hands or anything nowadays. So, but bottom line, he came up with that term when I met him a few years ago. Kind of inspired me to kind of look at some things differently. So, but mahalo ni for that, for the Aina to Opu uh, namaker. But as you document your your learning experiences, as you document the the, um, the the cultivation of your learning experience, it's good because then you're able to document your wins. And you're, doc, you're, able, sorry, you're also able to document your messy parts. I know oftentimes like in social media, we don't like to show like the messy stuff, but that's, I think it's part of it. Because for each win, we know that there's how many messy parts to our, um, to our lessons. Um, another reason why I think it's also important to document and put it out there is because you know, how many times have, a, have we as educators gone in and Googled something? Like, oh man, I need an idea on starting seeds. And you first thing you do is you Google starting seeds lessons, okay? And so I feel like that's good because it gives you kind of an idea, but we're consuming that content, yeah? And I think that, you know, no matter how or what state you're at, I think everyone has something to contribute. I think everyone can be a producer of content. And I think it really started out as, um, sorry, the reason, why, uh, the reason why I started putting out stuff is because I realized like, I can't just consume. I gotta also be a producer of this. Look, I think like karmically, I think it's a, a good idea just so that you're not always just taking, 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 yeah. Um, and if you look, if you think about it too, if you start following other folks, and it doesn't have, doesn't necessarily have to be on Instagram, but, um, Facebook or Twitter, it's like fun sized like professional development opportunities or lesson ideas. You follow certain hashtags and it helps you get that much more inspired. Um, if you, all right, sorry, there you go. So one major thing that I was really looking at was um, this particular lesson or unit or project, I guess, was um, provisioning the Makali. So a couple of years ago, we were posed with the question, could we, could we provision makali with enough food to feed 30, oh, sorry, 12 crew members for 30 days with only Hawaii Island grown food? And so that was a pretty big task. And I was like, okay, I, I got to figure out some way to document this stuff. And so we had some pretty great things that came about it. Uh, we acquired a freeze dryer and we were freeze drying everything under the sun. So Ulu and um, we had we raised our own chickens, so we freeze dried uh, chickens, uh, the chicken meat. Uh, we had a pig donated from Kaunamano Farms, and so we made uh, pork adobo and freeze dried that. Um, we tried stuff like eggs, and you can see up in the top right hand corner, kids even tried ricing uwala just to see if that would uh, be easier to to palate uh, for the palate because. Um, when they tried walla, it was really, really hard to, to, um, to eat just as is. So they're like, oh, maybe we can rice it. I think ricing was a really big thing at, at one point, like ricing cauliflower and stuff. But they had a, they had a ricer, and so they, um, they tried that in the freeze dryer. And, um, and even in the middle, they, we had some, we had quite an abundance of sugarcane, and we tried to, um, we tried to, uh, or sorry, we, um, we, we made vinegar. With all the leftover sugarcane juice, for, and that was for them to, um, for them to, for the voyagers to use, and but also too like, the messy parts are in here, yeah. There's so many messy parts, and behind every success, like I said, like there's so many messy parts, like the eggs. Honestly, eggs are horrible. Rehydrated scrambled eggs, like it's like grainy and has like weird texture. Oh man, it's it's tough. It's really tough to eat. Okay. Um, we realize that pork adobo will go bad if it's not if it's not um, processed uh, if it's not packaged properly, and so um, again, it's like 
you know, yeah, these are like really great ideas, but there's like so many stories behind each image. And again, your documentation helps not only with your reflection, but, and it helps with your gratitude. Like, so for every like messy part you've got, um, you're able to uh, revel in your like, oh yeah, that happened. Okay, okay, it's, we got this, we got this. But then the uh, nice part too, it helps with refinement. So looking back, now I have this, this mo'olelo, I have this, um, I don't say paper trail, but like I have this like log of things that had happened. Now, if I had to do this again, oh man, there's like so many things that so, I do so differently. And I think that just, that refinement, that's, that's just great teaching in, in general. Not that I'm there, I'm trying to get there, but it just helps your craft, okay? So first of all, so as we're, um, as we bring up kind of these ideas, like think about, is there, some, is there an experience that you, that you yourself as an educator are trying to facilitate at this time? Um, kind of keep that in mind because it might just be like this, you know, freshly cut log or it might be this like beautiful pohaku that you're about to carve or like a blank uh, tapa piece or blank canvas. But start thinking about that. Like, so what are some of these, what is, what's an experience you'd like to bring to your students? Yeah. And maybe we can help you refine it and make it a, a great one. Oh, um, and yeah, this is, all. okay. So this slide, so, um, the gentleman on the right-hand side, same as Jerry Kononui, and about six years ago, um, I started like small kind stalking him, and um, I'd follow him. Like I heard he would, I, I would hear he was like speaking at certain events, and um, you know, and I figured, finally found his email, and I tried to talk to him afterwards, and like, you know, what's, you know, I'd ask him all kind of questions about Kahlo, because I, I just had this like, you know, I, I was getting all this, all these varieties of Kahlo, and learning more and more, and I, I just was falling down that rabbit hole and I just, I needed to know more. And I heard he was the man. So I just kept bugging him like, hey, I'm a Kala, like, you know, what's the best Kalo for Ana Eva or Kea And, you know, I got this project, we're trying to provision the canoe. And and he's like, well, when you find out, let me know. And I was like, oh man, that's not it. like, and so I just kind of hang out and just kind of like try to listen and, and just see what he has to say. And um, finally he was like, okay, because I just kept emailing, emailing. He's like, are you on Facebook? And I'm like, like mildly, but I can be. And then he said, okay, check out this group. And that was it. And that was the Paulu. So he, he like threw that out. And then I, I realized like, oh snap, like with this, like this kind of, this style of like distance learning, it was worked for me because he would throw out like I would, I would say like, okay, what, what kind of color is this? And he wouldn't tell me, but he like kind of lead me towards there, give me some clues. And, you know, cause it's easy for him to like, look at it. Like, oh, yeah, this is this kind. But I thought it was really important because he was like, what's your resources? How do you know? Why do you know this? And what do you think? And he kept, he wouldn't give me the answer outright. And so for me, I was really grateful for that. And so as a result, like, in a lot of the learning experiences that we think about, or we, we kind of, um, they kind of um, that we kind of facilitate for our students, you know, it's, you know, what is that palu like? What? How do you, how do you get that student to be open to that learning experience? With Kalo and uh, Anakala Jerry, it was that was no that was a no brainer because I was already there, and he just kept feeding me. He kept feeding me, and. Um, it might be Aku, it might be Uala, whatever, whatever, you gotta, you gotta find that for your students. And so um, in the slide, you can kind of see a, a variety, oh, you can see a variety of learning, sorry, in this side, you can see a variety of learning experiences. And not everything's gonna speak to everyone, and that's the thing. Um, over the years, uh, just trying to expose students to different parts of Aina to Opu. You know, not everyone's really into farming, and then I get it, and that's totally fine. But at least they have to understand, like, there's more to it than just, like, you know, prepping your soil, planting things. There's people who are, you know, we need, we need the butchers. We need the, you know, the people to process the food. We need people to, you know, be techie and um, use the gadgets. And we need educators, too. 
And so um, on that, oftentimes, like, it's, you, know, you might have to appeal, but then another, another way to throw follow or, like, kind of get their ideas, like, or get their attention, I feel like, is um, how do we think about um, making them comfortable? Yeah, because sometimes, you know, kids aren't really used to being outside, and we get it. So it might just be like a, like a conditions thing. Like maybe they need something simple like gloves because they're not used to touching dirt. Okay? Maybe it's something simple like you know, providing cold water. Right? And, and sometimes just these basic needs, once they're met, once they're comfortable, then they're able to access that learning experience. Yeah? And so maybe you're, you keep your lesson short. Maybe it's, you know, um, you're not going to be only pulling weeds because you don't want them to walk away with that experience of like, oh, all we did in the mala was pull weeds. And that's their only mala experience. That's, that's a hard one. I get that it needs to be done. But bottom line, that's, yeah, we, we kind of have to think about what will the students walk away with, with your learning experience. Yeah. And to quickly expand on that idea, um, one thing that one of my Kumo taught me is that um, mala should not be a punishment. So um, a lot of teachers, they or not teachers, but a lot of people I know, they say, if you act bad, you don't do, you don't get your grades right. Um, you're gonna go outside and pull weeds all day. That's not how we wanna treat the mala. We don't wanna make it a punishment. We wanna be able to make it an enrichment opportunity, a learning opportunity where kids can go outside and be motivated to take their learning beyond. So we're, um, so one thing that I've always um learned from my kumu is, um, as educators, as presenters, as um students as myself a student or as Rod or DJ as a um, Kumu, don't make it a punishment. Try and make the, bring the fun out of it. Now, mahalo, mahalo for that Hayden. Yeah, that's, we gotta keep it fun. You know, Cause at the end of the day, like what is your, what are your students gonna walk away with? What kind of experience do you want them to remember? Okay. So, I mean, I understand like not everything can be like fun, fun, happy, happy, joy, joy, but yeah, just think about it in the what's the what's the final product? Yeah, now mahalo, mahalo, Aiden. So, um, yeah, so the, this COVID thing happened, and um, unfortunately, a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the things that we had in place that we set up months months ahead just came to a halt. And so we got to course adjust, we got to adapt and make do with the conditions that we've got. And so uh, summertime, we, we said, okay, what, are, what, can we, what can the students do at home? So we had, uh, we offered up, uh, we challenged students to do like malama aina things at their own home. Uh, we sent home, like these are milkweed seeds and some grow kits for students. And, um, you know, we, we were just at a, loss, at a loss for words at the time. We're trying to, figure out like, okay, how do we, how do we do like Aina kind of things when it's inherently very social and it's, you know, it's very place-based. And so we thought, okay, let's bring this back. Let's bring this to them. And, um, and it, it had like moderate success because it's, it's hard. Like some kids aren't really Aina folks initially. Yeah. And so we just did the best we could. Uh, one kind of cool thing though, uh, we had some math students head on over to the fish pond, Kumu Ola, and we caught invasive mollies and made fish fertilizer. And that's our molly pops in the, in the bag, not for human consumption, but that was to help supplement their soil. And so, and then like when students started coming into, onto, onto campus, we were able to um, definitely get into the Aina way more. And so, um, Again, there's the social di social distancing um, precautions. Um, students have to wear masks. Um, as far as like tools, like we have students wear gloves, and then at the end of the day, end of the session, we have we have them taken off, and I wash those, so that way we don't have to keep sanitizing all the all the tools. And we just kind of try to keep the spacing by allowing or by giving them activities that inherently are that or that can be like spaced well. So I mean, in this middle school, it's really tough. So, but we just do the best we can. Um, but over the summer, it's been really, you know, it was really awesome. Like uh, we, we got DJ, our culinary arts teacher on to full time. And the crazy part is he's actually been teaching virtually like 
Uh, he started teaching virtually, which is pretty tricky. He was our science teacher uh, before he came on as a culinary arts teacher. But um, he's got some pretty cool mana'o about um, ways to um, to streamline or, or to uh, kind of refine your your uh, learning experiences virtually. Thanks, DJ. Yeah, mahalo. Um, so it has been a, a big time of adjustment for all of us, really. Um, and I felt that in particular as I moved into this new position. I had been teaching seventh grade science here at Kamehameha Schools for the last two years. Um, and I was trying to build off of things that I had already done. Um, I was moving into a culinary position. Rod and I already had a really good rapport going. Um, and, you know, just, just linking with that idea of throwing the palu, just whatever we can. Um, and, and so this first lab activity that I did was actually with eighth grade science class. Um, who had been my previous seventh grade students. So I was already really excited because one, I was working with a group of students that I knew personally and I could call them by name. I knew their habits. I knew how to call them out and who to call out and you know who I could rely on for things. So having those initial comforts really made this transition a lot easier in that aspect. But as with all of us, you know, I'm looking at the results, you know, over half of the people who responded are, are still in, in, in a hybrid mode. Um, and so we're doing this dance, this balance between teaching lessons in person, between teaching lessons online, um, having conferences uh, via Teams and Zoom and whatnot. Um, but a couple of the things that I took from this is I really wanted to keep my, my standards alignment um, firm and pa and and in doing that, I think initially for this first activity, I really did bite off more than I could chew. Um, I knew that we wanted to build a lesson that we, we used an endemic plant that had been growing here on campus that the students already had a Pili with. Um, they knew Mamaki from our class in seventh grade about um, when we did a unit on the Ao Lapa Ao. Um, and so I felt like this was a good time to reintroduce also another data process, um, which I'll get into in just a moment. Um, but all of my lessons, I really try and take an essential question. And for this one, it was how does the length of the boil affect Maumaki tea? So you can see on the screen there, there's um, there was actually six samples and I brewed each tea, uh, kept variables the same as far as how much water, how many leaves of tea um, and and just brewed them at different lengths. And what we wanted to find out was how does the length of the boil affect the tea? Um, and we did this in a multitude of ways by taking three main different data points. The first one was using visual observations. Uh, the second one was using this device here. Um, it's called a Seki stick. I don't know if you guys can see. Um, there's this black and white pinwheel at the bottom, and this measures turbidity. And we use this uh, when we're looking at water density and quality and par particulate matter. So I was able to you know, on the screen, just like I'm doing with you guys right now, drop this into a jar of tea and tell them, OK, well, we got to 60 millimeters on this sample. Oh, that one, we could only get to 40 millimeters before we were unable to see our, our pinwheel at the bottom. Um, so it made things a little more interactive. Yeah, Rod, you can go to the next one. Um, and and by doing that, I think it engaged the students a little more. The third data point that we were taking was looking at the pH level and the, um, I used the actual pH probe. And I think that was actually our best data form that we used in that, that lesson um, because it was quantitative data that they could see right on the screen changing as I went from sample to sample and they were able to log them. Um, the most difficult thing was holding up this whiteboard, as you can see, as a background to try and get visual observations. And, you know, I had the same students in the same class giving me all kinds of uh, descriptions for the same T's and you know we found that that's really not the best way to do it um, so trying to stick to one or two variables that we really measure um, was probably going to be more beneficial in this way um, the other one that I really wanted to hone in on and that I kind of started working with a class in the year past was this clever writing strategy um, and this is one that I actually got from NSTA um, and and it's you might hear it as CER in um, language arts and other social studies where you really just provide evidence and reasoning to back up a claim. Um, and so this was valuable, but there was a lot of lessons that we learned in this in this first lesson. Um, and and by doing so, we felt, OK, we got to modify, we got to change things up. So this is when we we're full virtual, full distance learning. 
Um, and we'll get one into a, a hybrid model in just a minute. But, you know, we're getting about halfway through our presentation here and my throat, I don't know if you can actually hear, I'm getting a little bit parched at this point. Roddy and I, we're a really great team. Um, you know, we have, we kind of have this connection. Um, Roddy, I know you're down in the Mala right now. I'm up in the kitchen, but um, I'm thirsty. I'm kind of stuck here. You have anything you could, you could hook me up with? Yeah, well, I got you, got you. So yeah, DJ and I, we, you know, kind of like mycelium, we have our own little, uh, our uh, network, our own little internet action. So I'm going to pass this on to you, Bob. Sorry, excuse us for a minute. So here you go, incoming. Oh, man. Is that that's some water? That would be, I could really use yep. that at this point. You should be getting it pretty soon. Oh, oh, hey. Oh, looks like it's working today. All right. Thanks, man. That's nah, oh. easy, easy. You know what? I, I appreciate this. You know, you're you're down in the mall this morning. You're working hard. Um, you know, I know that you probably need a little bit of energy, a little bit of boost. Uh, I got some some carbs, uh, carb carbon carbs bar here for you. Um, you know, give yourself some nutrients. Hook up the plants a little bit. I'm gonna send it down through our our network. Wow, it looks super yummy. I had I a can... really small breakfast this morning, mm -hmm. and that, I think that'll really make it. Oh yeah, incoming, incoming. Nice. Thanks, oh. Bob. Thank you. Appreciate that. Right on. Glad you got what that. What time is it? Uh, okay, so I think it's almost lunchtime or snack time, I mean. So, you know, I got this ramen. Wondering if you can uh, actually hook us up with this. And if I send this over, will you cook it, please? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you okay. just gave me water. I'm definitely going to drink some, but I could, you know, use some to get some water boiling and then we get snack after this. Okay. Incoming, Bob. Incoming. Okay. Ooh, this, we got this it. A little harder. This is putting our network to the test, but bro, you and me, we, we get them. We get them. We get. Got it, bro. Got it. Yeah. Oh, the garlic pepper. Yeah, you. Garlic pepper. Oh, favorite. I like them spicy. All right. So the, Good. this little uh, discrepant event we we did was um, it's just to kind of illustrate the function of mycelium. Okay, so uh, we get from plants. Plants and mycelium have this really great relationship. Plants give water and extra carbon, chocolate chip carbon. And um, in return, uh, mushrooms are able to pass on um, stuff like nitrogen and phosphorus. So the ramen, din, din, nitrogen, din, din. So, but this actually was a, a lead into one of our first virtual hybrid kind of uh, learning experiences called the Fungi Fest. We had been working with Opala Foods and um, Volcano Mushrooms on acquiring uh, grow bags for our students, so mushroom grow bags. And so, uh, with sorry, with the um, with that, like, uh, and I goofed around with it a little bit at home, like during the lockdown. And I was like, wow, this is super fun. And so, um, it culminated in this uh, in-person event and. Um, yeah, so, and then DJ, you can kind of talk a little bit about um, how it kind of panned out. Yeah, for sure. So um, if we go to the next slide, this is one of our first hybrid uh, lessons that we really ever did. We were the first crew on our campus to bring students um, on campus aside from our uh, band teacher. Um, so yeah, next slide. Um, and, and what we wanted to do is really make sure that we link their learning experiences again to the life science standards that they were working on. Um, so it was a lot of hands-on experiential learning in the morning, teaching them about mycelium, their role in the ecosystem, and those how you know it plays and cycles in, in our own environment. Um, and they were allowed to do some hands-on learning. We, we had iPads where they used an app called Picture This to identify different organisms. Um, we looked at spores under microscope, and then the afternoon was actually spent um, just cooking all afternoon, which was really, really fun. I really enjoyed that. Um, we made mushroom musubi, we made um, a, a, a sautéed mushroom and onion that they got to eat with some, some sausages that they really enjoyed. So just giving them different ways to look at this um, through not only the scientific lens, but through um, a culinary lens as well. And that's kind of, you'll hear me say a lot, that's one of the goals of our program. Our program has lots of goals. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we... Um, 
using this idea, right, we had a lot going on. We had a lot happening, this being our first on-campus hybrid event. So it did start as that home um, Ohana connection where we where we started with a Zoom and it was a small group that we put the feelers out and said, hey, who can really commit to this? And having these grow bags at home and growing them and charting the, the growth and taking care of mushrooms all the way through. Um, so it was a select group of students, but, but what we found is that the more we engage the Ohana, the stronger that culinary, the stronger that agriculture connection became. Um, and by doing so, we were actually also able to help the family bring in their standards and understand more about, and then feel comfortable working with their students. Um, you know, we hear a lot of parents having to teach and become teachers during this pandemic, and we wanted to make that accessible. So by bringing the families into a Zoom, I think we did it at like five or seven o'clock at night, so, night, so that options are available. Um, but yeah, we really wanted to make sure that our protocol were in place, not only for COVID, but for our school. You know, we made sure we have the henna and panina at the beginning and end of the day. Um, and then this actually took place over a few weeks where the students charted the growth of their grow bags and then got to harvest and share. Um, and then the last uh, hybrid example that I'm going to share, Rowdy, we can go to the next slide, um, was another connection to our core curriculum class. And, and, and that's the way that our program is set up. We um, Rod as the agricultural teacher, myself as the culinary teacher, we connect with the core classroom. Um, and everything we do, again, is standards aligned. And this particular lesson was with our social studies class that was looking at the spice trade. Um, and we wanted to make this accessible. We wanted to make it reachable for all families. So this one, we kind of utilized a few different things. Um, I don't know if you folks who are in hybrid learning could do passing out of supplies or in full distance learning. I see there's some of you who had full supplies, um, but we did a pickup. And so we pre-measured all these spices. And I got to say mahalo to my wife who helped measure all of these teaspoons of spices out and pre-packaged them with me the night or two before. Um, and, and we really set this up as a take home and do what you can. And so we scaffolded it in that way. Um, if we can go to the next slide, Rod, we, uh, I made two different videos. One was for just a basic curry sauce um, that you could use making whatever you had in, at home. If you had milk, use it. If you have coconut milk in the cabinet, go for it. If you can only get water, that's fine. We can still make it. It may not be as good, but you get the process. Um, so really trying to meet these learners where they're at in their situation. Um, and then we, we upgraded it as well too. If, if you have meat at home or if you have tofu at home and you wanna make a full curry, go for it. Um, so I posted two videos on our on our website that students could use um, to really help them. And I think what what it, what made this a powerful learning experience was that Ohana connection. Part of the goal was to actually share um, them cooking and tasting and providing it to their family. Um, and I really have to say that the, the positive feedback from not only students, but the families were, was was quite overwhelming. Um, and I can't tell you, you know, how many folks reached out to me that I had never even heard from when I was their student's seventh grade science teacher reached out and said how much that they appreciated that. So by building and, and working in those Ohana connections, I think it provides more, um, more sustenance to our program. And I think people begin to see the value in that. And then the final piece that I'm going to um, share and talk about is just basically um, bringing that, that accessibility. You know, we, we have a lot of students, Rod mentioned earlier, who, you know, maybe they're afraid of, of going out in the mala. Maybe they have not so comfortable with touching the soil. So providing these experiences really helps them become um, more proficient in these, these realms, but also allows for more um, understanding. You know, I had, I had an eighth grade class here in the kitchen a few weeks ago, and I had an eighth grade student who said he had never used a stove. Um, and to me, my initial reaction was, all right, sweet, let's get on the stove. I'm going to show you how to use it. But then it really led me to believe in and think more about where each of our students are and to really try and reach them at their own level. Um, and that's why I think scaffolding in these types of experiences is really, really key. You know, you, you can have all sorts of tasks. You know, I had a, another student who's, whose father is a chef, and I mean, that student was teaching me things, and, and I really appreciate that. And so 
finding everywhere we can. You know, we all have such a diverse group of learners, even here at Kamehameha Schools Hawaii. Um, we really do have the whole gamut. And I think that's where it's powerful for our program that we get to take students uh, and go through these these hands-on skilled activities and it helps to build their confidence. Um, and that's really where the power of, of our learning comes in. Um, so we're going to go ahead and we have one more um, mentee uh, uh, activity for you guys. And we want to kind of be your sounding board for a few minutes here. So if you scan this QR code or if you had the tab open before, it's the same code. Um, but we're going to open up now a Wordle and just, just put in a few words. What are some events or lessons that you'd like to hold but have had trouble setting up in your current format? Um, and then we'll see what we can can actually try and, and help you guys out with. So we'll give you guys just a minute to put that in. And then also be creative. Um, although we are virtual now or hybrid, wherever you may be, um, there are numerous opportunities out there. Like I'll talk to you guys after we do this activity um, about that, but um, there are numerous opportunities and we can make it happen. So be creative. Don't think we're limited just because of the virtual setting. All right, so we're getting a couple responses here. I see habitat conservation, hands-on experiments. Just Aina to Opu, I like it, I like it. I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, just thinking about habitat conservation, um, I think that's something that can be done really well at home, whether it's you know somebody who lives on a farm or in the middle of the forest or somebody who lives in an apartment. Um, we can still look at our, our surroundings in our immediate location, in our immediate place. And I think that would be the best place to start is, is what's there. What do you see? What's going on? Um, starting to look at patterns within each of those environments um, and, and seeing those sorts of things really taking place around you and then finding something that's important and, and beginning to dive deeper into that. Oh, I want to conserve. I want to make sure that this plant stays healthy because X, Y, and Z, right? And so it's building that foundational um, understanding of one. Um, Rod, do you want to take one of these? Yeah, so um, STL, we, you know, funny because uh, just the different mode of learning now, I've been, I've been trying to focus actually on STL. I didn't mention that previously, but yeah, we, um, you know, we, we kind of use a lot of like reading, a lot of like, relaxation sort of techniques a little bit and then when they were in person well dabbling that like when they were um we're teaching virtually i had them do some yoga online and hard to regulate you do, you do the best you can really but um yeah that's that, that's an easy one you can kind of uh, incorporate like with small bits small bits at a time that's a good one yeah um another one i'll just jump in real quick you know food activities right so that's cooking I see a couple of those. Um, those are, are hard because my initial reaction is I don't want to ever force people to buy ingredients. I don't want to force somebody to have to do something um, because we don't know where all of our families are at. And so that's part of the reason why in that drive by pickup with the spice lesson, um, we wanted to meet families where they were. Um, one really easy one that, that comes to mind as far as looking at getting hands on, just being in the kitchen more. Um, is uh, like a, a simple like tops and bottoms soup um you know so you when you're making vegetables right you, you save the top save the bottom save the ugly part whatever put it in the freezer until you've compiled this this stockpile and then you can turn that into a vegetable stock you could turn it into a way to up your um your simon packet you know add a little bit more boost there so just trying to find ways that are easy and accessible um and we'll, we'll put our emails out here in just a little bit um and, and you guys feel free to reach out with questions if you want to bounce things off, if you want to collaborate. Um, and then I see some things about Kahlo, and I'm going to hold off on that because that's where Hayden is really going to jump in. So I believe uh, so at actually, this point, I'm going to take those two. So um, both Rod and DJ were able to share what they um, they picked a few. And I saw some um, of those. You guys put Kui Kahlo, Grow Kahlo, and that's a perfect set, um, transition into what I'm going to talk about. So um, if we could get the slides back up, please. So um, yeah, although that we are virtual, those were some amazing opportunities that I saw. And coming from a student standpoint, I would want to go to them all. Like I wanted to go to all of those. I'm going to be taking one of the ideas of Kuikalo. So um, 
Kui Kalo, it's one of our traditional things that we used to do. Um, it's a traditional way of making poi. Um, kui is the pounding action and Kalo is what we eat. So Kui Ai, the food that we eat. So um, Kui Kalo, what was? We have had numerous opportunities to do in-person Kui Kalo. Uh, so next slide, please. So these, um, on our next slide, we have um, pictures from numerous events. Um, numerous Kui Kalo events. So as you can see, these are in person. We have boards and stones out there and everybody's having a good time. So these are just some um, of the activities that I've hosted and I've been a part of. Most of these came from our Kamehameha Schools of Iho Olaulea. Um, some came from Amy Grima Botanicals Garden. Um, some came from when I was in fourth grade and I asked my papa, who is Jerry Konanui that Rod mentioned before. Um, he came into my fourth grade class to present. So we've had numerous opportunities. We made the boards, we made the stones, we provided the kalo, and we told the community, come out and learn your culture, learn how to kui kalo. So we have these amazing opportunities out there. But um, obviously, when COVID hit, we had to turn virtual. So um, at first, that was kind of hard. Like, all these are big community events, so we didn't know how to turn it virtual because we love the in-person factor. We love the ohana sense that we can build, the lahui sense that we build by um, doing these kind of events. So um, now we're at what's, what, what's happening now through this virtual setting. So, um, so what is, what's happening now? So now we're doing virtual kui kalo workshops. So myself alongside Rod, we have hosted three virtual kui kalo workshops. So the first two pictures on the top, that's from our actual Zoom. And then all these pictures below, these are some of the about 75 pictures I got um, are of just Haumana and Ohana enjoying their pa'iai, enjoying their poi that they made. And um, kind of piggybacking off what DJ said, um, this really helped to build Ohana. So we were all able to kui as one Ohana. It was really cool. So, um, on this bottom row, you can see a picture of an ohana who did it all together. Um, some people chose to do it by themselves, and then they shared their mea'ai, shared their food with their um, ohana. So, and one thing that my uh, really good kumu, Nick Kala Francisco, had mentioned to me is, use what get. So um, he had always taught me that ever since I was young, and that's basically what we did for this presentation, or for these workshops. The in-person ones, we supplied the boards and stones. But for, oh, Kalamai, one back. Um, but for the virtual kui sessions, we had, um, we'd use what get. So rather than using the traditional board and stone, we had students using a cutting board for their board and mason jars for their stone. We had people using spatulas and bottom of the, bottom of the coffee mug. So it was really cool and inspiring to see. I've always been taught the traditional way, which is board and stone. But working with Rod and not being able to provide the board and stones, that was really um, amazing to see how we turned it virtual. Um, and one thing that I have to note as, as educators, as the presenter, I had three, I was logged into this Zoom on three different accounts. So when you try and um, do these virtual events, just think about that because I had one on my hands so they could see what I was doing. I had one on my face so they could see me talking. And I also had, um, one that projected to my TV so that I could see the um, all the participants at once. So just thinking about that when you go into planning these um, virtual opportunities for your haumana. And then now we're at what's next. So we're at, we did these virtual kui, but now what can we do? We're slowly moving into a hybrid model and those kind of things. So um, if we could go to the next slide, um, or next two slides actually, what's next? So after our virtual Kui Kalo workshop, what we did is I sent out a Google survey. It's almost similar to the one that we're going to have you guys take when we're power presenting. But um, I really had some time to go over and look over this data. So all these Haumana um, responded and said what they enjoyed, what they learned, what stood out to them, how relevant was. And most of the responses I got were good. But like on the bottom left picture, I had some people who said um, it wasn't relevant. So now I can take that information and I can better tailor it to um, not only them personally, but for other haumana who um, might not be interested in kui kalo. Maybe I could relate it to um, health, because I know that's one thing that's stressed here at Kamehameha schools. We can be, 
be healthy and Maoli, live Mauliola through Mea Ai, Hawaiian Mea Ai. So maybe I can connect it through that way. And then um, we always work on connecting it to curriculum as well, like how Kumu DJ was saying. So I could work with our PE and health department to get a lesson there to teach the um, nutrients, the benefits of Kalo and all that kind of stuff. So maybe that will um, better target audience them. So it's really important um, as you go through these virtual events, make these things happen. Um, we can look at the data, take the Google survey and ask yourself, was this helpful? Do I want to do another one? And how can I improve? Um, so that's my Kuikalo. And that's just one of the many virtual opportunities that um, I've been involved in. Um, but like Rod and Kumu DJ perform, uh, talked about earlier, they did the Mamaki Lab and the Fungi Fest. And that's just some of the many things that they post on their, that they do with their Haumana. And most of the things they do, they post on their Instagram, which is Kiesaina to Opu. So I would really suggest checking those out. And because we're doing all virtual, we obviously have to be um, techy. We have to be using so much tech. So here at KS, we use um, certain programs and devices, and Kumu DJ can talk to you guys about some of the tech we use as KS students and as well as KS staff. Yeah, so in, in the lessons that we've been discussing so far, um, we've used one or more of these, these tech pieces that are up. Um, just going off of Hayden's last mana'o with the forms and the feedback and surveys, they're really, really valuable. Um, and you can create those very easily in Google Forms. Um, Zoom also has a polling platform um, that you can use. So, so those are really good just to get that feedback. And it's, you know, that whole, why am I doing this? How can it help? How can I improve? Um, I've been becoming a, a small kind of iMovie master the last uh, two to three to four to five months um and and that's really helped because kids can then watch a movie that i create you know something i do a short recipe um you know go out and show something about a plant um and then they can take it home and do it at their own pace and it's not so much okay we have this 75 minute block um the vernier graphical analysis was we used during um, that mamaki lab where i was using a ph sensor it's a free app that the kids can download um and it's really connecting sensor to sensor, but if you have it on your device, then you can use it, um, kind of how I was sharing and showing. Um, also another one that they can do experiments at home if they have an iPhone or, or just a smartphone, or maybe, I think it's only on phones, um, but Google Science Journal is another one that has all these different features and it utilizes your phone um, from light sensors to motion detectors to, um, picking up sound waves at certain decibel levels. Um, and so that's a really, really cool one. And they can log their experiments in there. Um, the middle one is the picture this app that we use to identify plants. I know there's a couple of free ones. iNaturalist um, is out there as well. But really, you know, kind of whatever, whatever you're able to use or if you want to bounce ideas back again, please let us know. Um, we're all still learning. And, and, you know, that's one of my my thoughts in learning forever, right? You just become a lifelong learner. Um, don't get stagnant. And this is a great time to really adapt and adjust uh, as we move into that. Um, so we, we really want to go ahead and just say mahalo to everybody who showed up, whether it was for 30 seconds or you stayed beginning to end. Um, we really appreciate it. We appreciate all the feedback and comments. Um, and I think Mr. Floro is going to share with you guys our, our uh, survey slide. So we have a, uh, another QR code for you folks. If you got a couple minutes to uh, give us some feedback on our presentation. Again, refinement is how we all get better. Uh, if there's any, uh, any follow-up questions, I'm sorry, we're, we're kind of out of time, but uh, please connect with us. Um, our Instagram handle, KSIN2OPU. We've got our email addresses. And yeah, we love talking curriculum. We love to talk story. So. But let us know. We're happy to share, happy to collaborate, happy to um, just bounce ideas around. But I think um, both of you had it, uh, both Hayden and DJ had mentioned this, but you know, one of the best people to uh, connect with is your students. You know, they're pretty techy too, actually, as far as the tech, tech side goes. There's a lot of tech that I've learned from students. So they're great teachers also. But again, mahalo nui for uh, having us. Um, as presenters for the HCBE um, for all conference, like this is 
been pretty humbling in lots of ways. But um, yeah, mahalo, mahalo nui. Mahalo nui, Ra, DJ, and Hayden. Um, you guys are getting plenty action in the chat box if you guys want to check that out. Um, I really appreciate the fact that you guys mentioned palu and like when we think of the word, we think about bait, but then I also think about like salivating. And I think you got all of us kind of ono for um, these new opportunities for our teachers and for our learners. So mahalo nui. Um, be prepared to probably get uh, communication from a lot of us here on how we can collaborate and how we can um, learn forward and move forward with our learners. Mahalo nui for your time. Um, so feel free to do the survey, closing survey. Just a heads up, Hayden needs evidence because he was out of class today. So help <laughs> him out. Uh, he did amazing today. Um, and help him out and let his teacher know that he was where he said he was, which was presenting at a conference. How awesome for 11th grader. So thank you, each of you, for being here. And we will see you throughout the day. Ahoy ho, malama pono. Mahalo. Mahalo kako.